So, the Jewish war is over. But before going on and talking about the other Jewish-Roman wars, we need to tie up some loose ends and figure out just where everybody is right now. First, the Jews who survived the defense of Jerusalem were sent throughout the empire and sold into slavery. Now, slavery is terrible, but Roman slavery wasn't like chattel slavery in some important ways. Many Jewish slaves would have been freed later in life, and any children they had would have been born free. So within a generation, Jewish slavery would have been a thing of the past. In 74, a year after the end of the war, Emperor Vespasian expanded Rome's borders to include this area of Germany, between the Rhine, Main, and Danube rivers, called the Agri Decumates. One of the rewards for fighting in the Roman army was the promise of a plot of land. But since the Jewish war had involved the reconquest of land that Rome already previously owned, resettling Vespasian's veterans there was a non-starter. Luckily, during his rise to Imperium, Vespasian had faced two rebellions on the Gaulish frontier. So settling the Agri Decumates with Flavian loyalists solved both problems. Many of these veterans brought their Jewish slaves with them to this new territory, which in Hebrew was known as Ashkenaz. And so the Jewish community that lived there came to be known as Ashkenazi Jews. Once freed from slavery, many of the Jews in Rome migrated south to the Bay of Naples, where there was a surplus of government-owned farmland to be worked without the burden of property taxes. The Italian branch of the Herodian royal family, led by Princess Drusilla, even followed their lead by relocating to Pompeii. Over the next several years, Pompeii became a popular destination for freed Jewish slaves, and even a center for kosher Roman cuisine, specifically the manufacture of garum, a Roman recipe for MSG that was used on pretty much every kind of food. But after less than a decade, the community was wiped out in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. The eruption had taken place just a few months after the death of Vespasian, at which point Titus became emperor, and many rabbis viewed the destruction of Pompeii as God's punishment for the man who had destroyed the temple. Interestingly, this seems to have been an attitude shared by the Jews of Pompeii in their final moments, as archaeologists working there have discovered a hastily scrapped graffito that reads Sodom Gomorrah. But make no mistake, the destruction of Pompeii was a horrific tragedy for Jews and Gentiles alike, and the loss of the community there almost certainly altered the course of Jewish history for the worse. The remainder of the royal family didn't fare much better. Agrippa II's twin and lover, Julia Berenike, became a mistress to Emperor Titus, but was quickly exiled due to rising anti-Semitism in the imperial court, and you know, the whole incest rumors, and was unable to return before Titus's premature death in 81. Agrippa's other sister, Mary Amne, married Demetrius, alabarch of Egypt, and their descendants would continue to manage the port of Alexandria for at least a couple generations. Agrippa died childless sometime in the 90s, and his private lands in Syria were inherited by his great-niece Julia Crispina, the last known heir to the Hasmonean and Herodian dynasties. Julia would continue Agrippa's role as episkopos, or caretaker of Jewish-held lands in the Roman East, but her influence within the Great Sanhedrin would only weaken as, without a temple, her Sadducee allies no longer had any real reason to exist. With Jerusalem in ruins, Caesarea became Judea's administrative capital, while the new Nasi, Gamliel II, moved the Great Sanhedrin to John ben Zakai's yeshiva at Yamnia. Barred from governing the province, the Sanhedrin became a purely religious institution, and in 85, it officially proclaimed that all messianic claimants up to this point were illegitimate, from Judas of Gamala to Agrippa to, yes, Jesus of Nazareth. It's at this point where Christianity well and truly broke from Judaism. Although Peter and Paul had renounced Jewish ritual law back in the late 30s, Christians of Jewish descent still continued to recite Jewish prayers and make sacrifices at the temple. Well, without a temple, the pretense was lost, and Jewish ritual fully faded out of Christianity, which then began spreading even faster among the Gentiles of the Roman East. At the end of the first century, the last of Jesus' apostles died, and the Gospels started being written down, of which the most aggressively un-Jewish has to be the Gospel of John. It is this gospel that first posits that Jesus is not only the Messiah and a metaphorical son of God, but a literal aspect of God himself, in a doctrine that came to be known as the Holy Trinity. This has no basis in Jewish theology, but strongly echoes elements of both Roman emperor worship and Greek mythology. Interestingly, the idea of Jesus as God seems not to have been limited to Trinitarianism. At the same time, 
a rival movement called Docetism purported that Jesus was not only God, but had never been human, which kind of defeats the purpose of death and resurrection, and quickly died out on its own. In 96, the Senate overthrew the tyrannical Emperor Domitian, ending the Flavian dynasty which had first brought Josephus to Rome just a couple decades earlier. Having outlived his imperial masters, Josephus' final works, Against Appion and the Life of Flavius Josephus, give a fiery and uncensored defense of both the Jewish people and his own conduct as a general in the Jewish war for basically the first time. Flavius Josephus died around the year 100. Although he was only in his early 60s, let it never be said that he did not survive. With his passing, another wave of revisionism enveloped the Jewish world. Bereft of the institutions of the temple or the monarchy, Jewish diaspora communities began, much like Josephus himself, to sympathize openly with the former rebels in their midst, setting the table for yet more and far bloodier Jewish-Roman wars. Special thanks to my patrons, including Geonim level patrons Lev Cham and Vicky Nelson. If you like this and want to support the channel, you too can become a patron on Patreon, linked in the description below. You can also find links to my sources for this video in the description, as well as a link to my book, An Armada of Cats, Travels in Israel. Otherwise, you can always like, share, and subscribe. I will see you next time.